the most original talk radio station anywhere. We are LA Talk Radio at latalkradio.com. You're listening to Question Reality. Question Reality. With Priscilla Leona. Priscilla Leona. Only on LA Talk Radio. Hey, welcome to Question Reality. I'm your host, Priscilla Leona, and we are coming to you live from Hollywood, California. Our show is broadcast every Sunday from 5 p.m. to 5.50 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Now, if this is your first time tuning in, our show will help you to question your career reality. This show is for you if you were are or might be considering a career in the entertainment industry. Our guests provide advice and tips and resource information on how and what it takes to pursue a career in show business. I couldn't get that out. I lost all air in my body for a moment. Uh, Now, our guests work in various professions of the entertainment industry. So what that means is that we will definitely have someone on the show from a career that you are interested. And you can find all of that out because if you want to check out the past guests, read their bios, listen to their interview instantly, or download one of the shows, go to the LA Talk Radio website, which is latalkradio.com. And if you're listening to this show live, you're already there. So you go to the top of the website, click on the link that says channel one, scroll down, look for the graphic of our show, Question Reality, and click on the link. And this takes you directly to our archive page where you can view the list of all of our past guests. We have little descriptions of the guests so you can go exactly to the ones that you're interested in like producers, directors, models, actresses, you name it, writers, novelists, comedians, it's all listed so you can choose the ones very, very easily. It's very user-friendly. And uh, our shows also are available for download on iTunes under the podcast section. So when you're on iTunes, just type in Question Reality Radio and there we are. You can download them from there as well. If you want to find out more about our future guests, and I just have to say thank you every week because this show has become so popular and I'm so, so happy. We are booked usually, no kidding, six months to a year in advance. Do you know I'm already booking my very last date for March of next year? And then I'll be going on to April. So it's a great thing. Thank you, everybody. I'm so glad you love the show and I get so many great emails from people. So thank you so so much for listening. I'm so glad you like it. And I am so happy that my guests have been able to help so many people. I think I'm going to start next year. I'm going to redesign the website and start putting up the post of all of the people that have sent me emails and told me what a great show it was that they listened to and how it really helped them get a perspective on their career. So look forward to that next year. If you want to check out the website directly to see the upcoming guests, uh, go to questionrealityshow.com. Question realityshow.com. That is the official website. And we will be posting uh, all of the guests for the new year, probably around October. So you want to look for that. Now, we have a fantastic guest for you today. Her name is, I love this name. It just, it makes me smile every time I say it. It's Nancy Chris. Who doesn't love that name? That is a totally cool name. That is a star name if I've ever heard one. Her name is Nancy Chris. She is, among other things, she's an actor, a producer, a director, and she's also president and co-founder of Nandar Entertainment. And I am going to go into my advertisements, but I want you to pull up her website while I am doing that, unless you really want to listen and learn something. Uh, But her website is nancychris.com, N-A-N-C-Y-C-R-I-S-S.com. Also, Nandar entertainment.com n-a-n-d-a-r-e-n-t-e-r t-a-i-n-m-e-n-t dot com nancy chris dot dot com and nandar entertainment dot com and um we are going to talk to her in a couple minutes but i got some interesting stuff for you guys for around the town let's see now, a lot of people have said, uh, can, when are you going to have some more voiceover uh, people on? So um, I don't have anyone scheduled for the rest of this year, but I do have a couple of people scheduled for next year. And again, you'll be able to see that schedule in October. 
But I do, however, have uh, some classes. One class I want to tell you about if you are curious about voiceover work. Uh, you know, as an actor, you want to get work wherever you can, and voiceover work is wonderful. If you want to make the step to being a working actor, uh, why not try this way? Uh, if you're looking to get your voiceover career back on track, you go in classes uh, always is a way to do that. And a lot of people are scared of it. So going to a class, you can actually just demystify your path to get work over work over voiceover work consistently. So a lot of working actors everywhere have made voiceover work their bread and butter. And believe me, you get paid a lot of money and and you can get work frequently. It is a wonderful, wonderful career. And for the ladies, you don't have to wear makeup. Yay! Or a push-up bra. Yay! Or heels. Super yay. Uh, there is a voiceover workshop with casting director, producer, and manager Cheryl Lynn Carter. And that is coming up on Saturdays. Now get your pen and paper or however you jot things down and those days are Saturdays October the 1st October the 8th October 15th and October 22nd so I would imagine that's every Saturday in October so October 1st 8th 15th and 22nd and the class starts at 4 30 and the location is at 2703 West Olive Avenue in Burbank 2703 West West Olive Avenue in Burbank. It's a four-week session. And the, I, I tell you, this is really a good price for those of you who don't know what a good price is for a voiceover class. It's only $225. So that really is a good, a good price. Break it down into four classes and you'll see what I mean. Now, a little bit about Cheryl. Uh, Cheryl Carter has produced and cast hundreds of television commercials, including Super Bowl ads. Uh, she does radio and interactive spots at TBWA Chiat Day in Los Angeles, and she's been doing that for almost 14 years before she branched out on her own with Precision Talent. And she produces, right now, she's producing audio. Uh, she also coaches voiceover talent. She casts commercials commercial projects. And she's also, Cheryl uh, is the founder and president of Precision Talent Voiceover Management. And her company centers on educating um, and empowering voiceover talent, I guess, as well as marketing them, because that's part of the process, marketing them to different media forms. And as president, she oversees the acquisition of all the talent, the coaching, the marketing, as well as the day-to-day -day administration. And she's also a creative director and a casting director and producer for all audiobook and multimedia audio production. So... She is. She has her hands on everything, and she makes sure nothing gets out of there until it is absolutely 100% perfect, and you are ready to book a job. So she's spoken at uh, the Actors Network. If you go to uh, to those seminars that they have, she's been there. She's uh, been a speaker at UCI, CLU, and UCLA. And she is holding classes at uh, ACW. And this workshop, again, when you go to these things, uh, that's Actors Creative Workshop, ACW. And the workshops that you go to, they're not job interviews or auditions. And even though they have cast directors, agents, managers, they don't guarantee you or promise you employment. So you know that the class is solely educational. So you want to check this out. Uh, the website is trulyacting.com, trulyacting.com, and you can find out all of the payment plans that they have, or you can pay, or you can email them at info at actorscreativeworkshop.com, info at creativeworkshop.com. So I've had a couple of people have taken Cheryl's class on a personal note, and they said she's really good, and she's fun, too, which is very important. You don't want a stuffy old person teaching you anything. Next, on October the 3rd, October the 3rd, Film Independent presents the 2012 Director's Lab. This is so exciting if you are a director um, or if you want to be a director. 
Um, it is an intensive eight-week program running in Los Angeles in February and March, and it is designed to help directors who are prepping their feature films with a primary focus to learn to work with actors and the rehearsal process, because a lot of them don't don't even have that experience or have had it, but they find it a little difficult adjusting to the process. Um, so the deadline to apply for this is Monday, October the 3rd, and it's film independent. It's 9911, <coughs> excuse me, 9911 Pico Boulevard, 11th floor, Los Angeles, California, and it's $55 for members and $75 for non-members. And if you want to find out more about it, go to filmindependent.org filmindependent.org and you can find out all the details but I highly recommend that to directors who want to learn more about working with actors and the whole rehearsal process and or a person who wants to be a director it would be really good to find it out as well on Saturday December the 3rd from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the Marriott Marriott. Is that how you say it? Marriott. Marriott. Yeah, that sounds good. Marriott Burbank Airport. There is a, um, now, first of all, workshop speaker applications are now available. It's the Showbiz Expo. And this is the largest trade show and networking event for the entertainment industry. If you would like to conduct your own workshop at Showbiz Expo in Los Angeles, you have to fill out what's called a speaker application. Applications are due this week, September the 30th, and they also have exhibitor space available. So you want to call today and get a great booth location and an early exhibitor booking discount is available. So you want to visit that website at theshowbizexpo.com, theshowbizexpo.com. And you can also call 212-404-2345 to get that exhibitor kit and your prices, application, and contract. So there you go. I hope this was helpful to you guys. Lots of stuff going on. We can't fit everything, but those are the ones that I thought were important for the day. Now let's get back to the show and let's meet our wonderful guest today. A little bit about Nancy. Nancy Chris is the, um, she is Nandar's co-founder and president. She is a woman of many talents, all emanating from entrepreneurial spirit. And you got to have that entrepreneurial spirit if you want to be a filmmaker, for sure. Um, now, this entrepreneurial spirit, this energizes her, her ability to create opportunities from success in everything she does. This was quite evident in little Nancy at age 11 when she won won a regional championship in Western horsemanship. And her love of horses and involvement in rodeo and ranching continues to this day. So she is quite a competitive little girl. Now, by the age of 13, Nancy had begun her career in show, bu show business because she had a role in the TV series Petricelli. Or is it Petrelli? I can't remember, but I think I... I don't know if I saw that, but it sounds so familiar. It's Petra. We're going to have her pronounce it. But um, she followed that up with a recurring role in the Paramount series Webster. Now, who hasn't seen Webster, one of my favorite shows? And before long, she was appearing in a variety of TV and feature film commercials and stage plays. And Nancy released, very exciting for her, she just released her new film, Finding Mr. Right, and it's W-R-I-G-H-T, so keep that in mind. And who doesn't want to find Mr. Right? So we all got to go see this film because who doesn't want to find Mr. Right? Everybody. Uh, it's a romantic comedy, and it's starring Matthew Montgomery, David Moretti, and Jason Stewart, and it is receiving rave reviews. And you know, Jason Stewart, he is an upcoming guest. He's going to be on the show. He is a comedian. He's very funny, plays all around the town. So she's going to have Jason in it. You know, it's going to be funny. And um, it's apparently it's receiving rave reviews. So whoa, congrats to Nancy. 
Now, she's also working on a new project, a thriller called Crimson Creek. Oh, now I like that title. That sounds like a nice bottle of wine. Crimson Creek. I love it. Oh, it also sounds very scary, too, because it could be a big old bloodbath of a creek full of blood. So we're going to find out what it actually is. So without further ado, let's welcome you, Nancy Chris. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. Nancy. That's an honor. What a great introduction. Did you thank you. You right. Fall asleep? <laughs> oh, my God. I hope that it will put you to sleep. <laughs> oh, no. My God. That was wonderful. Thank you. Talking, talking, talking. I, I think you need to introduce all my radio interviews. That would be wonderful. I, I can take you with me, Priscilla. <laughs> I think you're right. Let's put the word out. That's going to be my That's sole right. note. Radio interview. Okay, and then Nancy comes on. <laughs> uh, Nancy, again, thank you so much for being on the show. I hope that today is very rewarding and fulfilling for the people that are listening. And I want to start out with my question first, which is what I like to ask every guest. Um, as a little teeny-weeny girl, what type of profession did you want to pursue as a child? What did you want to be? Who did you want to be? What was going on as a child? Wonder Woman, you know, who did you want <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, I should not come on wood. I am doing exactly what I wanted to do as a kid. And I know, you know, and that's really hard for people to say. So I count my blessings every day because, you know, from the time I was little, the two things I was always into is always one build and act. And uh, my horses, I've always showed them and rode the old all my life. You know, I think I learned how to ride a horse before I learned how to walk. So, you know, I'm very fortunate today to still be doing what I was doing, you know, when I was a little kid. Well, now, how so. did you first know that you wanted to do that? Was it, uh, were you watching television and you had an epiphany? Where, was it a play you saw? What, when was your first memory of wanting to be a filmmaker? What was it that sparked that interest? Well, it, you know, the, the filmmaking process really can, came afterwards. That's where I got more on the creative and the producing side. You know, I like being on both sides of the camera. But at first, it was, a, you know, every kid, you want to act. And uh, unfortunately, you know, I had grown up in Arizona and in Tucson, so we were out by O Tucson Studios, which then Universal Studios was, you know, always coming in there filming. And my mom had to be friends with uh, some of the crew. So whenever they'd come and film, we'd go out there and, you know, play cowboys and Indians, uh, jump on the wagons, fall off, the Indians are attacking me, <laughs> you know. So right. I grew up kind of like playing in the business and row acting just out there. So it was kind of, you know, being around it. And my very first thing, which is uh, Petro Shelley, the TV series that was with Barry Newman and Susan Hayward, and actually... First audition I ever went on, you know, my grandmother took me to it and uh, actually got picked for it. And I was playing a drug addict. So it was inside the HL scene. And I was just, I think then at that point, being young too, and you got paid a lot of money for just, uh, you know, if you only said one word, you know, back then it was like 300 and something a day compared to the 700 a day now, you know, for a uh, right. When speaking for it, but it was just like, you know, oh my God, how can you pay somebody that much money to say like one word? Because this girl, all she had to say was like, you, out. And they had to keep redoing the take and redoing the take because they didn't like the way she said those two words. And I, was just, I just kind of got fascinated with the whole process and, you know, and then my love of horses and competing, you know, I grew up competing and um, still do today. So. Now, um, how did your parents feel about your chosen profession? Were they always supportive of that? Uh, my dad more so because my dad always wanted to be an actor and always wanted to be in the business. And, you know, he did a couple little things when, you know, before I was born and stuff. And he really had the love and passion for it, you know, and I think that was the one thing that him and I had in common the most was the love for the entertainment business and making movies. Because the very first film that we ever produced in our entertainment was a Western called Two Legends of the West that had the most notorious bad guy, Bill McKinney, from Deliverance, 
who's done every movie since then. Um, and Mickey Jones, who was in Home Improvement, and I played Chris Radkin's wife from, you know, Long Ago Blue Lagoon. Everybody knows Chris from there. And I remember, I, you know, I was asking, you had to make Donald's in downtown Phoenix, and I told my dad, I said, you know, Dad, I want to make a film. And he's like, what? And I said, I want to produce a film. We can do it. You know, because it's like, one of the things that, you know, you, you always hear in this business, and I really believe it, you know, if if you want to be successful in it, you need to go out and do it yourself. You know, don't sit around and wait for people to make it happen for you. Because it's, it's not going to, you know, your agents, your managers, they try to help you get work. But just you, even as an actor, it's just much your responsibility to get out and get those roles booked. Or if you want to make films, be creative, find a way to make it happen. And we did. We raised the money. And, you know, it was kind of challenging for our first film. We did a Western period piece, but it was a comedy, too. And it was a great experience. And it's just kind of went from there, and then we did we did that film, and it wasn't shortly after that. I that little film, I actually got a call from NBC, and actually an email. I got an email from NBC, and they were saying, you know, hey, we heard you did a Western comedy. We would like you to come in and talk to us, and they were looking at doing it as spinoff as a TV series. So it's like you never know what's going to happen and how one door opens another door. That's right. Now, if your parents are, if parents are not supportive of their children's choice to be in the entertainment business and they're giving them a lot of hassle and they're just really, I mean, you, you, every child wants the parent's approval. If the parent does not absolutely want their child to go in the entertainment business, but your heart is just leaning that way, how does one stay committed? How do you keep that focus? What would you suggest to someone who's in that situation? Yeah, you know, that's a good question because I think a lot of it is your inner personal drive. Like for me, you know, my family wasn't really big into it when I was growing up. And, you know, after Patrick Kelly, I kept getting a lot of calls to do other things. But at that point, and I kind of kicked myself in the butt now because then um, what I did was I was having so much fun as a kid and road dealing and playing with my friends. I didn't take a lot of the calls or I didn't go to, you know, I didn't accept the jobs. And it's like, you know, my um, parents they were like, you know, whatever I want to do. They were pretty good about that. You know, on my end, but I know there's a lot of parents out there because I hear and people ask me all the time, well, you know, I don't have any support from my family and my friends. I always say, you know, you know, you're wasting your time. And it's just like, you've got to keep that passion in you. And sometimes it's hard as a kid until you actually get past like 18 and you can strive and go out and really work hard to reach your dreams. But, you know, I, I really try to always surround myself with positive people that's so important and you know you just got to dig deep inside yourself and hang on to your dreams because you know I did that I went through years of having no support and even friends saying you know you're wasting your time you know you're you're losing money you know it's never going to pan out to anything well it has you know I've been you know a Thank God, the, you know, the production company's doing really good. Our recent film, Finding Mr. Right, is getting great reviews. I could not be more happy with that film. And it, But I stuck to it. And I tell you, you get a lot of no's out there. But like you hear, every no is one no closer to a yes. So it's Absolutely. just like, you know, you, you just got to dig deep in it and really hang on to your passion. Because in this industry, especially... You get beat down every day, and it's from the people in the industry and outside of the industry. So you really have to dig deep in your inside, and it's just, you know, life's too short. Now, so do you like, it it do you feel that um, going to film school will give you an advantage in this business, or do you feel that it really doesn't matter? No, I think it does because, one, it's networking, and that's another big thing in this business is networking. And it's like, you know, I, I've 
taken more meetings time after time that never turned into anything. Or somebody says that they can do this and, and they can't deliver. I mean, it's redundant in this industry. And it's just, you know, you. I think film school is important. I think acting classes are even important. You know, I had the opportunity to meet uh, Doris Roberts a few years ago. And I remember her, you know, telling me today she's still, I mean, this was like five years ago, takes acting classes every Saturday. Well, you're talking Doris Roberts. You know, everybody knows her from Everybody Loves Raymond. You know, you would think somebody on her caliber at this point would not be taking acting lessons. So, you know, I really admire that because it's like she goes, you can always learn and perfect your skill and you need to stay at it and work at it. Absolutely. Now, if someone wants to pursue a career as a filmmaker, but <clears throat> maybe a little cautious and wants to have another career to fall back on, if it doesn't work out, maybe the parents were harassing them not to go into it and they thought, hmm, well, let me have something, let me have something mm -hmm. uh, on the burner. What career would you suggest that might be just as satisfying and lucrative or something, something that might be similar. I don't know how you could do that, but what what would you yeah. suggest? Well, I mean, you can, it's working both sides of the project, you know, even if you want to be an actor, but if you're working on the production end. Because to me, even as an actor, and I think a lot of actors should take editing classes, because you learn the continuity and so much about you as an actor that's not just about how, you know, how you portray your role and how you play and so forth. Production-wise and for your film, it's also continuity. And, you know, if they did this one move during this time, how important that is. So, you know, I, I think, you know, you have theater, you have, if you just surround yourself, maybe it's not the exact field that you want to be, but, you know, if you surround that and you network, you eventually get there. You know, I'm lucky enough now, after taking years and years of meetings that never went anywhere, that I am now working with, you know, Emmy-nominated and Oscar-winning producers right now. So it's like it was a long road there, but it was a lot of networking and so forth. And, you know, a lot of actors are like, well, you know, I don't want to act and, and not get paid to do a job. And I'm like, you should do every job, whether you get paid for it or not. It's still mm -hmm. working your skills. Mm -hmm. You need to hone them. It builds your credit. There's nothing ashamed, to be ashamed of in this industry. They think if I don't get any kind of money, then, you know. They're a failure. It's oh, my credit. God, Nancy. Yeah, oh, I hate ridiculous. that. I hate I know, that. I'm just like, you know, who cares? Are you doing what you love to do? That's the most important thing. Are you getting to act? If you want to be an actor and you're getting to act, go do it. You know what? I you don't know? need as soon as I hear an actor say that, they are so history to me. I don't even want to deal with them because those are people who are not doing it for the love of the art, the love right. of the craft. They just want to, want the celebrity. They just want mm -hmm. a name and to be known. And those are not true artists in my book. Those are not the people that I even want to deal with. So as soon as I hear that, I have no respect for them at all. Because you, if you're an actor, you want to act because it is the craft, the love of the art. You want to take another character. You want to be become another character you want to be all that you can be for that character for the love of it and you'll act whether or not people are looking or not you'll act in your room right. you'll, you'll beg people to look at you you'll actually pay people to look at you that's a, a true actor not someone says well i i'm not going if i'm not getting paid i'm not going to do it oh boy that gets me mad nancy yeah. it really does I, 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 it's true. It's true. And and those are the actors that are going to end up getting the Greyhound bus right back to Hackensack or mm -hmm. wherever the hell they're from because oh, yeah. They won't. You know, they yeah, won't either be that here. Either that or they'll end up on reality television. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, what's funny is, you know, after True Legends, you know, I had the opportunity to go to the Academy Awards, and that was exciting. And, and that's what what kind of drove me, too, because, you know, sitting in the audience and actually being at the Academy Awards and, and you know, people going up on stage, it was just like, I want to find that one project. I don't have to win it, but just to be nominated that the works that you did for recognition, you know, probably 
there's three things that I like best about my career, and it was from a little play that I was doing. It was Lost in the Yonkers. We were on tour around it. And when we were in Phoenix, and afterwards, I played Bella in the play, and I was walking out, and the, the elder couple was in front of me, and they didn't know I was behind them. And I heard the one lady say to the other, oh, that dimwitted girl was really good. And I'm thinking, well, that's what my character was. So if I really had her believing that I was a dimwitted person that was just playing that role, right. that was like the greatest compliment to me, you know? And then... I had one lady tell me in Tucson that I reminded her of Diane Keaton. What another great. There's just these little moments that make it worthwhile. And my mom's one of those tough four, eleven, just tough women, hardcore. And they're like, your mom cried. I'm like, I've never seen my mom cry. So I'm able to make her cry through the play, through a play. Those in my life are like three major things to me. That's all I care about. I, you know, I don't care about the money or anything else because... You know, I love what I'm doing. And I took a long road there. I started a delivery service in Arizona, and I spent five years building it up and making a lot of money so that it I would allow me the time and money to go pursue my dreams. So it didn't just happen overnight, and I kind of took the curve, like we were talking about a little while ago about having another career to fall back on or so forth. My whole goal was that company was to build up financial freedom in time so that I could go make my movies or I could take off and, you know, go do a, a film, whether it was acting or producing. That is so a great, like, that, that is a really excellent piece of advice because a lot of uh, young people just want to jump right into it and do filmmaking and they either one don't have the equipment that it takes or don't 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 have the money to be able to rent the equipment or they mm-hmm. they have so much strife from uh, worrying about how to pay the rent how to eat and 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 then they 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 give up a lot of them do because yeah. they just want to get in they want to get to it and get it done and do it it now 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 and they do not have the funds and resources to do it right. so i like uh, i like how you're offering well, the that's options. where you, you know, know money is driving their passion and that's you can't right. you know and right. depending on where you want to be you, you know if you want to be in this business for the long haul you know well i'm, I'm 51 now so I, i've been in this business for a while and i'm still here <laughs> you know, not kind of wood. And it's, it's every year it gets better. Right. You know, and it's just, but yeah, you've got to, you, you got to be smart about it. If you want to be in the business for the long haul, you know, two things. I think you need to have something to fall back on because there's so much stress in this business to begin with. You don't need it when you're out there trying to act and, you know, during your act, you're thinking, you know, I got to get this job. If I don't get this job, I, you know, I can't make my car payment. I mean, you know, I just don't think you can have that stress and be that successful. I guess unless you're one of those one hundred million that get picked out of the crowd and just happen to make it, you know. But well, what, what do you what do you su- what do you suggest for the person who see you you just use that word business and a lot of it. it, it a lot of people who are artists, they are artists and they lack the business acumen. Right. And there are some that are very lucky that can balance both. But as we say, show business, it is show business. You have to mm-hmm. have the ability to manage your business. And part of your business is making sure that you can have a job to be able, some sort of job to be able to pay your rent and your bills so you don't have that stress along with the stress of trying to make a film. So how do we get the point across to these people? Because a lot of people just just think that they can come here and that it's automatically going to happen. What can we tell them? I mean, what, what, how can they, um, if they don't have, uh, were, if they weren't born with a silver spoon, they have no money. They came here with <laughs> just the money. I mean, what, not to say we don't want to discourage them and say, you're not going to make it, but what can they do to get it going? Yeah, you know, I wish I had that little magical wand that would say, wake up, people. 
this is a business just as much as it is as an artist industry. It's almost business before your craft. Because you've got, you know, even when you're in it, it's a business, you know, whether you're trying to book jobs or, or be a filmmaker, whatever, it's still the business aspect. you got to treat it like a business and you're your own commodity. And it's like, you know, so many people, and I hear it all the time, they're so mad at their agents or their managers, they're not just booking up jobs. You know, well, right there, too, is, you know, you can really find it and go through and match up somebody that works for you. Just don't take the first agent manager because you're desperate just to have one because, oh, if you have an agent manager, oh, you're an actor now just because you have an agent and a manager. I know. know, It works that way. That is so true because you don't know how many people I run into who just came here from another state and they think, oh, my God, I have to get an agent or a manager. I have to. And they think that once that happens, that's going to be the end all for their career. They're going to be launched to stardom. But an agent and a manager, first of all, a legitimate agent manager are only going to take on people that have established credits. So, first of all, if anybody takes you on and you have like four credits on your resume, you have not progressed progressed at all you right. have pretty much are with somebody that is going to be sucking the little bit of money out of you that you are lucky enough to get right yeah because they're going to talk in oh you need new headshots you need new resumes that's right so it's such a scam yeah. in la it's ridiculous. called It's called payola, people. If you go, if you sign with someone and they take you on and you're like, wow, I was really lucky. I only have three credits on my page. Mm -hmm. They're all from my high school play. Well, you know what? (laughs) You're not lucky. You are, I don't want to say dumb, but you are not thinking logically um, because these are people who are going to say, oh, you know what? I like your pictures, but my friend, John Smith, can do a better job. And for five hundred fifty dollars, and no, right. yeah, no agent or manager should ever really recommend any of those people. You go, you get shots, you come back, and then you take it from there. But um, let's talk about characteristic traits now. I very much am a believer, and I do believe this to be true. You do have to have certain characteristic traits that are complementary or fit into the career that you have chosen. If not, you know, you know, you're if you're going to be a mortician, for example, you certainly don't want an upbeat, perky, bubbly mortician, right? <laughs> right. So if you have right. those characteristic traits, that's not the job for you. And vice versa. Now, if mm-hmm. what what three what are three characteristic traits do you feel that it takes to be a really good filmmaker? Wow. You know what? Listen. <laughs> I think that's a big one. Which because, one? What did you, you know, say? Listen. You you have to listen. Not be always the one talking. Also be a listener because um you know, one of the things when we did Finding Mr. Wright, the, the idea as a director is I like to see what my actors can bring to the table. So I'm one of those rare directors where it's just, and I heard it from a lot of the interviews that we did afterwards from the actors that's on our Blu-ray version. They're like, one of the things that they liked best about me too was is because I allowed them to come to the table and see what they had. I just didn't have a mindset. It either worked or it didn't work. But I allowed my actors the room to have creativity with their characters. So some of the things that they did and and that actually wound up making the cut of the film weren't even in the script. Right. And, you know, in this, and we come into this film by far was the best cast and crew I have ever worked with. We wow. had no problems. The crew was very professional. Everyone came prepared. And that's so important. It's like, leave the egos at home. You know, that's the characteristic trait for me is come to work, be prepared, leave your ego at home. And it's like, you know, to me, it's very important you treat everybody equal on set. I don't care if you're the PA or a star of a film. I don't want to hear anybody talking down to anybody with respect. Everybody is treated equal. And it's like, you know, 
come to set on time. Be, Absolutely. You know, be, be prepared, be professional. That is so important. Be courteous, be professional. And, you know, things run so, so much smoother. So, you know, to me, it's like leaving your ego at home. Don't hold up production. You know, be, in, especially as an actor, and even my crew, be prepared. You know what's happening that day. And, you know, we, I, I, it blows me away on this film. We did not have to do one single take for a solo retake because an actor didn't know the line. Oh I've my never God. been on a film where that didn't happen. What? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Even my DP was like, these actors are incredible. Ooh. I said, I know. He goes, they're, for every single person, I don't care how small you were, they were so phenomenal, so professional. You know, I would hire them in a heartbeat. And that's so important because, you know, especially as an actor, you want to be able to get rehired. You know, you see a lot of films where you see a director always working with the same actor. That's right. You know, and that's because, you know, that you have great chemistry, you work well together. And I do that with my crew. I use the same crew from project to project. I don't care, you know, what film I'm shooting. Oh, my God. You know, I always use the same crew. Because, I mean, they literally know what I'm thinking at this point. <laughs> right. If you, you find know? somebody that works really well, you know, I want to talk about that real real quick for a second. Because when I first started out, I started out in theater. And what I noticed and what me and the other, uh, we, we were in like, a, you, you know how they have cliques, not only in film, but in mm-hmm. theaters. What's your little oh, click? Yeah. We used to talk about how some of the directors always use the same people. And uh, I was not, uh, at that particular time, I was more of like the, I was starting out as the assistant director. So I was listening to the actors complaining about that. And being new in the business, I thought, hmm, well, I, I would just think that it was because they really liked the people and they like working with it. But we saw that happen mm-hmm. over again. So we were, a couple of the actors said, you know, nepotism, nepotism. And I kind of thought, well, I better think about that for a while because I don't th- I think they should give other people a chance. But now I completely understand it, especially out here in L.A., because you are afraid to work with new people because you don't yeah. know show up. I mean, no, I have talked true. to people. I have talked to people that were so nice and gave me a whole snow job about uh, stuff, and then they never show up at all. And mm-hmm. so, you know, you're afraid. You want to work with people who are dependable, reliable, and produce the same top quality material. So that is something for you people. If you find good people to work with, keep them on and. Don't even worry if somebody says you're participating in nepotism because that's not true, first of all. It's not, um, yeah, and, and we're not doing it for that reason. And we're yeah. doing it because they're talented and yeah. they're professional. They yeah. show up to their job on time. They know their lines, you yeah. know, or crew-wise. They yeah. show up. They're prepared to work. Right. And, you know, it's just – if, if they're a I good would, keep them you know what nancy i want to we only got a couple more minutes because we got to end at 5 50 so i want to get in one question and then we're going to go on to talk about finding mr Wright in crimson creek i i'm going to answer one question that we got for you today it's from a gentleman named lewis in seattle washington and he says uh dear nancy how do you think Female fun. Oh God! You know how they send emails. I can never read them. Uh, okay. How <laughs> do you feel? Grammatical problems. How do you think female filmmakers' choice of films to make has changed from their inception of filmmaking, or has it? What the hell does that mean? Well, how do you think? No, I'm uh, not think- really sure. How okay. Okay, I think he's saying, uh, Louie, you need to go back to English class. Love you, but this doesn't make sense. Okay, I think what he's saying is, um, as a female filmmaker, do you think that uh, films have changed from when they started to now? Like, I would guess. I'm going to take this question over. I, well, what I would say is not so much that you know, films have changed. Yeah, but the yeah. opportunity for females yeah. is definitely better now than what it was, Yeah, you know, even 10 years ago. It's, you know, the doors, as a director, you know, we're still nowhere where I think we should be. 
But I think it's definitely easier now than what it was even five, ten years ago. I think it's definitely, you know, changing. And that's, just, but I think a lot of it's because there's, you know, we look at there's not a lot of women that do it. So then you look at the odds of, well, it's such a male dominant, but if there's not a lot of women trying to break into it, then our numbers still look low. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, excuse me, that is not Lewis, that's Louise. Sorry about that. <laughs> Louise, you still got to write your emails better. Um, I, would imagine, um, I, I, would, I would imagine she's talking about in the inception of when women were, were making film uh, films, uh, they pretty much would, you know how the studios would just automatically say, okay, well, they can do comedies or romances. Romance, and that, right. you're, not, you're not even going to touch a thriller. I, I mean, you're not even going to touch an action film. Forget about it. So do you think, I guess Louise was saying, do you think that it's changed and more women are getting those opportunities from the studios is what I was thinking. And I, I'm going to answer that too. I think they most certainly have. I mean, uh, what was mm-hmm. that movie, that big movie? A couple, was it uh, the, oh Jesus, the, the Big Blue Sea or The Rising or it was a huge movie maybe in 2005 or six. But that was a, that was a, an incredible, it was about the world coming to an end or something. Oh my God, I probably should have had a yeah. rough but anyway, yes, oh. I see a lot more. Uh, yeah, I think it's changing. Well, look, our yeah. next film, the, well, actually, I'm not directing it, though, I'm producing, but it's, uh, you know, a thriller, too, yeah. that we're heading up. But, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I definitely think that that. he's out there. Let's talk now about that. It. Now, let's talk about that. Finding Mr. Right. What's it about? Just give us a brief, uh, a b- brief overview of what Finding Mr. Right is about and how can we see it? What's going on? Yeah, it's uh, actually it's it's uh, we just released it on DVD September first, um, and it's doing really well. I think we've gotten like five six reviews in that are all really well. I think if you go to Finding Mr. Right the Movie dot com, you can click on it, and then you'll see reviews on there, and also where you can buy the DVD. But this can we watch film. it on uh, Netflix, Amazon? Where can we go? And- no, we haven't released it there. We'll be going. We're in the midst of talking about a television deal right now. We already have, uh, you know, distribution for the film. The Netherlands just picked it up. Um, I, we're in with Germany right now. So it's, wow. it's doing well. I mean, it by far exceeded my expectations because it was just a little independent film that's based on, you know, uh, Finding as you know, a guy that's wrapped up in his career and you know, afraid to step, uh, you know, take that step outside his comfort zone and stuff. So, you know, and it was kind of a fluke how it came to me because the writer had actually got off of inktip.com, which is a great site for finding scripts. And, um, what, what is it called? Yeah, it's inktip.com, E T I E T I P, like. I N K T I P dot com. Oh, oh I'm gonna. I, yeah, I'm gonna it's a, yeah, great <laughs> site because actually Crimson Creek I got from a writer off of there too. I'm gonna and write that down. Just, Nancy, I'm yeah. sorry. It's can it can you spell it one more time? E. Sure. It, no, it's ink like from a pen. Ink. Oh, ink. I N K. So it's I N K T I P dot com. Okay, got and it. You can do. You you have to be in the industry, and they approve you, and then they'll send you. You can research all the scripts on there. There's a lot that you know are guild writers on there, or non-union, and you know with yeah. these projects non-produced. Anyhow, he had um, Jake. I had got another thrill from, him, and he contacted me, and, and he's like, "Hey, I know you'd work with Matt Montgomery on Fear House, and I have a script that I think he'd be good lead in." He goes. Would you mind having them look at it for me? So it's one of those network teams where you find somebody that knows somebody, you know. And I said, yeah. I said, let me read it, and you know, first, and then you know, I'll, I'll take a look at it and I'll pass it on to Matt for you. Well, when I read it, I just loved the story. So I said, would you have anybody producing this or directing it? And I said, no. And I said, well, uh, I would love to direct and produce it. And so that one just kind of fell across on my. Wow. And a year later, we have it made, and it's off, and it's doing great. And before the DVD was even 
we released, we already made like a third of our budget back. I mean, it's, it's wow, that we is released a, a couple of weeks ago. Wow, so, that well, is yeah. Incredible. We're gonna have to have you come back and tell us how you got your <laughs> money back before you've even done anything with it. Um, and um, like, we actually got some pre sales. Oh my which god, is really hard to do. And oh we're doing my that god, with some too. We gotta, oh, so. you are, oh, Nancy, you are coming back <laughs> next year and All tell right, us what your secret is. You have to promise me you're coming back to tell us. Oh, how of course. That. Hey, uh, I want to talk to you. you. Uh, it is 5.50. Uh, we actually have to go, but real quick, you got a new thriller coming out, Crimson Creek. Tell us about it in like 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Oh, my gosh. Um, It's just a real cool sci-fi um, little thriller. You can look for it on Facebook. Okay. If you just Crimson Creek, the movie, you'll be able to follow along. We're just doing the creature designs for it, and we're going to be probably putting up in next week uh, the poster for it. Woo! So you'll be able to find out a lot about it. So I have an artist working on that, and we're just fine-tuning it and oh designing the creature. So. Well, I, I, I am now a fan of Nancy Chris. I am a ah. Nancy fan so you have to promise me you're coming back next year i'm gonna book you for that last date in march and we're gonna find all out right, go ahead. <laughs> we're gonna find out about finding mr right finding mr right the movie.com we're gonna find out how crimson creek uh how well crimson creek did and we're gonna find out what new projects you're working on so i'm gonna get you for next year and we're gonna talk about how you made money before the film was even finished <laughs> thank you you so got it sweetie much. i'll be happy to thank you so much for coming on nancy you were a wonderful spectacular guest god bless you and uh i hope that these two films rock and that you rock oh, that you. you are walking the red carpet and sitting on steven spielberg's lap at any time there you go <laughs> that's right move over boys move over boys here comes nancy chris go to that's her right. Nancy Chris. And I'm bringing Priscilla with me, so we're over. Right. <laughs> Sandar Entertainment, Nancy Chris. Thank you, everyone. Say goodbye, Nancy. Bye-bye. Thank you. You're listening to Question Reality. Question Reality. With Priscilla Leona. Priscilla Leona. Only on L.A. Talk Radio.